Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode six of the Garot Podcast. I am your host, Chingachgook, and I am once again in studio with my co-host, Mr. Howard Rourke. So I think it's probably wise for us to laterally drift for a couple minutes before we dive right into the meat of what I see this episode to be, if for nothing more than to ensure that we have our bearings. What I want to do for today is present some material that has been drifting around in various forms, in various shreds, in a variety of different notebooks that I have collected over the years. And what I hope to do, Howard, is to present to you this material and then afterwards riff around some commentary about your initial thoughts or reactions to this material. And then we can get into the meat of the discussion because there are a couple of meme terms that have arisen from this material, although Prior to today, I have never actually formally presented the material to you. I am happy to say that at this current time, the material is now in presentable format. So it'll probably make the process of talking about that which is presentable much easier. To speak more directly, I have here a fable a kind of parable that has been drifting around the recesses of my mind for some time. And it is a fable, it is a parable that I came up with over my long years of observing a variety of peculiar phenomena that I think will become more clear as we begin to talk about it more. But prior to this episode, I never wrote it down in a comprehensive sense. I come from a tradition that is not particularly attuned or skillful in articulating knowledge in the most precise of terms. I come from a tradition that speaks in fables, speaks in parables. But what I hope to do in this episode is to present this parable that has arisen in my mind in response to a wide variety of pathologies that I have observed and encountered in the world, and then harvest from that in a more articulated form, sort of the moral behind this parable. One of the things that's very useful, that's very commendable about Aesop's fables, as an example, is that at the end of each of the fables, the moral of the story is always presented, clearly. I remember being a child and reading through my household copy of Aesop's fables, and it was this old beat up text, and the fables were never more than three or four pages long. But always at the end of each story, there in giant bold letters was the phrase, moral of the story, colon, and then it would state whatever it would be. I don't have that at this current time, but I do have the fable itself. So what I hope to accomplish in this episode is to bring that moral of the story into full articulated form. Are there any questions you'd like to ask before we jump right into it? Would it be helpful to present the terms themselves, or would you rather do that after the presentation of the fable? I'd say let's do that after the presentation of the fable, the parable. So it was an interesting process collating all of my notes that I've collected over time from jotting fragments of these images down, these visions, and then trying to compile them in a way that makes self-contained sense in a single document. But the name that I have settled upon for this story is the parable of the monkey, the tiger, and the bull. And without further ado, I will go ahead and present to you and our audience who's listening at home the story. So here it goes. The parable of the monkey, the tiger, and the bull. The forest is the home 
of a large variety of creatures. Among all the woodland animals, the monkey was by far the shrewdest and most cunning. Seeking to advance his own personal gain by any unscrupulous means, a trait amplified by the power of his knowledge and understanding. One day, while he was walking through the forest, the monkey found an old, discarded coat of the most peculiar design. The coat was long, covering the entirety of his body with long sleeves to match. At the end of each sleeve was an odd iron bell. Instead of ringing a clear sound in the manner of most standard bells, this pair of bells, the monkey discovered, enabled the sleeves to create a sharp and terrible thunderclap when the coat was shaken in a specific manner. Realizing the opportunity before him, the monkey quickly donned the coat, took up a staff from a nearby rotted tree, and made his way to the central forest clearing calling all the woodland animals to himself as he made his way. At the forest's central clearing, with all the woodland residents gathered around the monkey to await his public announcement, the monkey stepped forward to address his audience, adorned in his newly found coat. Behold, cried out the monkey, I have gathered you all here today to unveil the most auspicious of tidings. For years, you have known me as a simian, a mere beast such as yourselves. But today, I come to inform you of a new truth. I am now changed, evolved, of a higher order of existence. I am made anew. I am now man, imbued with the power and might of his guns that I now wield. The world is to be remade in my image. I, as a man, am made in the image of God, separated from the beasts of the field. I am your new master by divine right and essence. These are self-evident truths derived from facts, and you must bow before your new master. And with that, the monkey snapped his stick above his head, releasing a terrible burst of sound with his sleeve that echoed through the woods as all the animals shrank in fear at the sound of the all-too-familiar death cry of the hunter's guns. However, among the animals was the tiger, the most powerful of the forest residents. After the monkey's display, he stepped forward to speak. I have done battle with the humans retorted the tiger, in a loud voice for all to hear. The scars on my back are a testament to my encounters with the guns of man and the awesome power that the humans wield. You may be able to fool the other animals here who have never stared down the barrel of a hunter's rifle, but you cannot fool me. I have confronted the true form of man on countless occasions. And I know what I see. You are no human. You are nothing more than a charlatan. The monkey laughed, stretching his arms akimbo, as if to display himself. You use your experience to exalt your own arrogance, the monkey said to the tiger. Your bias blinds you to simple facts that stand before your eyes. You accuse me of fraud. But where specifically are these so-called lies? I am here, in the open, for all to see. I do not hide like a coward. You judge the world by the standard of your own eyes, and if there exists any deviation from your perspective, you immediately dismiss it as false. Indeed, you have gotten lucky and slain many hunters who have ventured into this forest. I do not believe that the fact of my standing here today after all these years is a simple matter of luck, the tiger retorted. Then challenge me if you dare. Even you are not foolish enough to directly confront the might of a human gun. At this, the tiger somberly stepped forward to confront the monkey in full view of all the other woodland animals to watch, to demonstrate 
what his eyes knew to be true. The monkey, once again, raised his staff in the terrible manner of the hunter's guns and cracked his sleeve, releasing the all-too-familiar sound of a gunshot. The tiger, armed with instinct, developed over years of experience, began to dash to and fro to avoid the all-too-familiar fiery sear of the human's bullets and closed the distance between himself and his opponent. However, every time the tiger would close in on the monkey, the monkey would wield his staff and release the terrible thunderclap, which would instigate the tiger to use his fierce agility to roll and duck out of the way, giving the monkey an opportunity to jump back to a safe distance away from the tiger's claws. Several minutes passed in this manner. The monkey and the tiger locked in this lethal dance on public display for all to see. However, no matter how much speed and power the tiger exerted, he simply could not seem to sink his claws into the monkey in the same manner that worked on the humans with all their godlike powers. It was as if this monkey, claiming humanity, was more of a wraith, leaving behind only empty air where living flesh should be. What had gone amiss? The tiger, in his growing frustration, could not understand why his hard-earned principles and methods no longer seemed to apply to that which his eyes knew to be a farce upon the monkey's initial declaration of his new-found humanity. However, unbeknownst to the tiger, standing on the sidelines, hidden inconspicuously in the observing audience, was the bull. Although the bull had none of the tiger's speed or agility, or his experience with doing battle against the humans, he did possess fortitude and shared with the tiger an understanding that the monkey's declarations were lies. During a lull in the tiger's and monkey's combat, the bull took the opportunity to step forward to address the tiger. Your prowess is of no use here, said the bull to the tiger. There is something amiss about this monkey that is rendering your combat methods useless. But how can that be? retorted the tiger. The principles of combat are universal in nature. We all walk the same earth, traverse the same environment. They do not simply evaporate like the morning mist simply because we choose to deny them. Doing so is what leads to certain death for both man and beast. This is not to say that new strategies cannot arise to meet new problems. That is exactly what makes the humans so powerful. But if something has changed, it must be knowable. What? has gone amiss. The bull shook his head. I do not know. Your power, skill, and experience far exceeds my own. I have never done battle with the humans. I cannot provide to you the answers you seek, nor can I explain how the monkey performs his trickery or where it lies. But make no mistake, we both can see that the simian is no man, though I cannot explain why. Then how do I proceed if capitulating the entire forest to his megalomania is to be avoided? I'm afraid you do not, replied the bull. For all your prowess against the humans, you are not the one to complete this task. Then who? asked the tiger. To everyone's surprise, the bull stoically stepped forward to confront the monkey. At the sight of the slow bull, the monkey began to openly mock him. You insolent fool, proclaimed the monkey in a loud voice for all to hear. You, of all the lowly beasts in the field, have the gall to challenge a man? Even you, as insipid as you are, Know full well that the guns of mankind allow us to regard you lumbering bovines as our nightly evening meal. The monkey menacingly brandished his staff at the bull. Come die at the mouth of a hunter's rifle 
if you so dare. Indeed, I am slow, replied the humble bull. I do not possess the speed or agility of the tiger. And though I do not know when or how, your chicanery will invariably fail to stand on its own merit. Of this, I have the utmost faith. Just like with the tiger, the monkey and the bull squared off, and once again the monkey resumed his maniacal taunts, unleashing an Olympian storm of thunder from the edges of his sleeves, dwarfing the terror of his duel with the tiger, causing all the observing woodland creatures to instinctually recoil in fright. However, the bull, unwavering, strode forth at a moderate but unwavering gait. Even as the monkey's blasts became more frantic, the bull held true to his course. Within minutes, though the monkey tried repeatedly to evade, the bull was upon the monkey. The monkey's staff came down upon the bull's skull with a thunderous boom. But, to the monkey's surprise, the bull did not turn away as the tiger had done countless times in the previous duel. Rather, the bull lowered his head and closed his eyes in solemn determination, allowing the monkey to strike him directly upon the forehead. To the shock of all the observing woodland creatures, including the bull himself, he was not struck dead immediately. The power of his momentum carrying him forward the bull, in so doing, forced the monkey to drop his staff in order to save himself. As a consequence, the bull was able to catch the monkey's sleeve with one of his horns and rip the entire garment off of his body, revealing the monkey's true form for what he actually was. A mere beast. The monkey tried to escape, but... In the face of the bull's forward momentum, and now lacking both his staff and his coat, he had no ability to retreat anymore. His only recourse was to grab onto the bull's horns with either hand in an attempt to control the bull's head. In this manner, the bull had inadvertently put a stop to the tumbling chaos that had characterized the tiger's duel with the monkey. For several moments, the bull and the monkey remained tensely locked, head to head, their respective strengths in direct opposing contact. But, in the end, the monkey's arms were no match for the bull's strength when trapped between his uncompromising horns. In a single swift motion, the bull gored the monkey upon his horns allowing him to then immediately trample the simian under his hooves, leaving behind nothing more than a lifeless carcass. From that day forward, though the tiger maintained his primacy and prestige as the fiercest and most versatile of all the woodland animals, all knew that the bull's methods, though cumbersome, were wholly irreplaceable. So there are obviously a couple things that I want to get to, but before I do that, I'd just like to open the floor and ask, what are your thoughts? Are you interested in a thumb up summary or do you have a more specific question? I do not have a specific question at this time. Well, in terms of what requires focus from the story, there are three major characters that parallel with three techniques that are used to debate or have a discussion, if that's what you can call it. The stage, though it's a very specific stage, is meant to be a familiar one. And these interactions between these three characters are comparable to the way that this type of character would otherwise interact with both the world and with the other characters on the stage. From the onset, the monkey is a problem, but it's hard to say exactly why the monkey is a problem, but that's contained within the story, in the sense that we can say why the monkey is a problem, but that might go under the final colon of the moral of the story. Even in a simpler format, 
where, for example, the monkey was snapping the coat. And even if it was as simple as the monkey, the tiger, and the bull, just themselves, and the tiger and the bull look at each other, and they look at the monkey, and they say, hey, can you not snap the coat? That's quite obnoxious. And then the monkey looks back at them and says, make me, and keeps snapping the coat around as a monkey would. That's supposed to be built into the story that there's a problem there that needs to be addressed. But there are two fundamentally different ways to approach solving this problem. One, though powerful, is insufficient. And the other, though cumbersome and not intuitive, as you say, to everyone's surprise, including the bull. He didn't know exactly what was going to happen. It is an effective way of dealing with this monkey that is just trying to dance around and evade being captured, while deceiving everyone into allowing him to maintain his authority. There are parts of this that are very deceptive when it comes to the monkey. The monkey has a staff that is meant to look like a gun, but nobody can tell the difference. So the bull could not have said to the tiger, hey tiger, that gun's not a real gun. That just wasn't information that was available. And the monkey knew that. So even though the tiger was dodging the bullets that weren't there, but he didn't know that they weren't there, so he still had to dodge them. Part of the problem that the tiger had and that the tiger couldn't get to the monkey. But another part of this that is very revealing is when you say, it was as if this monkey was more of a wraith leaving behind empty air where living flesh should be. And that the tiger, though powerful, was trying to pin something down where something should be, but the thing was not where it should have been. The monkey managed to deceive his own position so that when the tiger looked to attack, the thing that should have been there when the tiger was attacking wasn't actually there, which is what caused the tiger's frustration. Brought into the comparison of people who are talking to each other, the people who are using the technique of the tiger within a discussion, whenever they attack whatever this person is saying who is using the technique that the monkey uses, they find that whatever they're attacking should be able to be attacked. But when they go to attack something, for some reason it's not where it should be. For some reason the material that ought to be able to be attacked and brought down has moved somewhere else. It's as if the person using the monkey's tactics is one step ahead of the tiger all the time. So I want to take this opportunity really quick to interject and acknowledge something. Because as I was reading this story, as I was writing this parable, one of the things that I could hear in the back of my mind were people sitting at home, listening to this podcast, saying to themselves, what on earth is this story talking about? What is the monkey supposed to be representing? And I want to take this opportunity to point out to our audience by piling onto what you were just saying, this is a story about methods of discourse. The monkey represents a specific way by which individuals conduct discourse on a topic, on a question, in a certain kind of manner. Their methods are characterized by this monkey. And then you have two alternative forms, methods of discourse that are characterized by the tiger and characterized by the bull. And that's kind of what I hope to unpack in this episode. So when the generic individual comes up to me and says, hey, I listened to your parable, I read your parable, but I don't understand what this monkey business is all about. You're talking about animals. I want to ensure that this podcast can provide a very thumb down answer to the thumb down question that asks, what is this parable talking about? It seems to me that the most tangible answer to this thumb down question is one that states this parable is about methods of discourse. Not only just methods of discourse, but specifically the way in which methods of discourse can be hijacked. 
can be subverted, can be surreptitiously subjected to trickery, to chicanery. Even though there are ways that methods of discourse can be hijacked and subject to trickery, it's also very much worth noting that this parable is referring to an interaction with a method of discourse. The individual is meant to be what we might describe as decisively malevolent. And I think that that's worth noting. If there's no distinction between what is or is not malevolent, if you in the audience don't think that there is a such thing as malevolence, I invite you to reconsider. There needs to be a distinction for what is and is not malevolent, lest you find yourself on the path towards becoming exactly that. You need to know that you're not that, and in order to know that you're not that, you must grant that it exists, and it does. The monkey is one such character in this story. And the monkey does not have a good ending. There isn't a lot of room in this story, if at all, for the monkey to change his ways. The monkey is so committed to his deception that he will die before admitting that he's lying. You and the audience do not want to find yourself in that position. Because if you do, it's not going to go well for you, especially if you encounter a bull, for example. But that's also to say, if you're listening to this and you're reconsidering it, that this is obvious enough material for you to avoid the horror that is preferring death to the truth. I don't think that it's intangible for me to say that the Logos is preferable to death. The Logos is better. The Logos generates what's better, so if you're following the Logos, then you can generate something better than death. But you're not following the Logos if you're committed to lies to the point where it kills you. I'm not saying that these situations aren't preventable, because they are preventable. But the character that is the monkey is not interested in this prevention. Perhaps that's also an invitation to be interested in prevention. So there are problematic forms of discourse that are happening. And granting that the monkey's discourse is problematic, and I'm, again, really hoping that it's not difficult to grant, but if you listened to the opening paragraph, to the opening statements of the monkey, talking about how I am your new master by divine right and essence, these are self-evident truths derived from facts, and you must bow before your new master. If you listened to that and you said, okay, no, no, this character needs to not be in charge. He does not have the authority that he's claiming. What do we do? How can the monkey be stopped? That's the intuitive question, hopefully. And I'm trying my utmost to be careful when I'm talking about granting that what the monkey's doing is wrong. Because there are people in the world that look at the monkey and say, of course, that's right. The monkey's not wrong. And I'm trying to be careful about automatically granting this because we are talking about a level of malevolence that people need to understand how to properly fight, how to properly combat in order to actually access the logos to improve the world. And I don't want to just grant rashly that the character that is the monkey is obviously wrong and I'm trying to be careful about granting that because I'm also trying to be somewhat optimistic about an individual that might look at the monkey and say that the monkey is correct in the case where someone is looking at this, initially granting that the monkey is correct, and then reconsidering. Because that's better. I don't think that it's also outlandish to say, wouldn't it be great if the monkey just reconsidered his ways and turned toward the truth? And it would. But he doesn't. And if he doesn't, what do you do? The tiger and the bull are trying to answer this question. They're saying to themselves, it would be great if this monkey just realized he was wrong and started telling the truth and said, no, never mind, this is just a stick. I don't need all this power. I don't need to lie myself into continuing to rule over all of you. I happen to find this coat. 
I'm still going to wear it because I think it looks cool, but I'm not going to use it to initiate the use of force or impose upon any other creature or person. All that whole stuff about my divine right of rulership. Never mind. I was wrong. Sorry. As you were. That would be great. But the people who have tried to talk to individuals that wield the discussion methods that the monkey uses, they know just how difficult it is to get someone to turn towards the Logos, to change their ways, to actually start asking the question of what's better. I would argue that the monkey is not doing that. I would argue that the monkey is not concerned with the Logos. And that leaves the tiger and the bull with a very perplexing question. A question that I've asked myself, a question that I'm sure other individuals have asked themselves after they've been assaulted by the discourse of the character that is the monkey. What do I do about this? You hear someone talk like that, and if you have any sense about you, you recoil and say, why is this person doing this? I ought to be able to figure out what's wrong with what they're saying. The tiger and the bull both know that the monkey's wrong, but why? Maybe I can just figure out why. Maybe I can just show what the monkey's saying is contradictory. Maybe I can just present something that's more reasonable with a better alternative. I can use the logos. I can say that this individual's statements don't make any sense because they contradict themselves all over the place and that these are better statements to replace them, statements that everyone can accept to make the world a better place. But by the time you say that, the person's already moved on to something else. They're already on a different talking point. You've attacked the wraith where flesh should be. You've been deceived. And the conversation goes nowhere. Or worse, perhaps even the conversation goes in favor of the individual who's rejecting these rational arguments. Which thumb down is usually what happens. Well, right. The tiger's strategy is problematic because it doesn't get the job done. And the strategy that the tiger is using is very rational. It's very powerful. It's very technical in its proficiency. But even that surgical precision is not enough to keep the character that is the monkey from dancing away while you attack the ghost somewhere else. And people who try to approach these conversations with someone that is not interested in the rational response, but more interested in moving to the next place that allows them to keep their authority, it's very frustrating trying to deal with these individuals, especially when they have authority. And it leads the tiger to a sense of, I would say, even hopelessness. How can you proceed? Which is what the tiger says. How can I continue? How can I proceed? A rational argument in response to what this individual is saying is not something that this individual is concerned with. It's a fundamental difference between the methods of discourse. The tiger is granting that the rules of combat are the same. The tiger is granting that the monkey is following the rules, that they're all playing under the same rules. And one of the things that the tiger says is, if something is amiss, it must be knowable. It's true, but he doesn't know. Not yet. If he knows where the deception is, then he can be one step ahead of the monkey. Perhaps that would have been a better method of combat for him. But generally speaking, in the way of discourse, these individuals aren't interested in rational discussions. And the question becomes, well, what do you do when someone's not interested in a rational discussion? You can't just be more rational with them. And that's where the alternative comes in with the bull, because it's not that they're wholly irrational. They're still saying words. They're still having a form of communication. They are still making declarations. Correct. Most fundamentally, they are still making claims. Correct. The monkey's position is clear. Just nobody can keep track of how he defends it. Nobody can get him down on it or pin him down on it. Well, right, but the monkey knows that. Mm -hmm. And the monkey knows that when the rational argument comes, this is what you do in order to avoid it. This is how you dance around it. 
This is how you dodge the rational argument. And it's just a matter of constantly escaping to the next pre-planned point. The monkey is still making declarations. He's still making claims. The tiger is responding to these declarations and responding to these claims in a way that's very powerful, rooted in universal principles. And notice, the monkey is never able to lay hands on the tiger. But the monkey doesn't need to. The monkey just needs to create the stalemate. Correct. The monkey doesn't need to address what the tiger says directly, which is why the argument always moves on to the next talking point one step ahead of whatever the rational response is. That's also why comments have been made indirectly regarding methods of discourse, where it's like you're not talking to an individual. It's like you're talking to someone who is moving on to the next talking point of the ideology rather than actually responding to what it is that you're saying, despite the fact that you're responding to a point that they just made. They're not responding to the point that you've made. They're going on to the next point because that's where the escape lies. You don't have to actually fight the tiger. You just have to make sure that the tiger can't actually touch you. You just have to confuse the tiger enough that he keeps swiping at air. That's the objective. This is very thumb up, in case you weren't aware. Discussions of talking creatures is very thumb up. Thumb down will eventually have to be addressed. Sure. So, rather than the rational response to the talking point itself, there is a secondary procedure, which is the formation of the bullhorns. At this point, I suppose I will present the first of the terms, unless you would prefer to do so. It's fun. I have a slight commentary to make after you present it. Well, the term that we would use would be a problematic tiger move. So on the list of terms, as the glossary of terms continues to grow, a problematic tiger move would be defined roughly as a situation where two individuals engaged in discourse find themselves in such a situation where one of the individuals is, for example, malevolent, the other individual is trying to figure out how to properly respond to malevolence when they see it. And if the individual responding to the malevolence is responding in such a way where an argument is being made directly, but that individual doesn't care about the argument that's being presented to them, even though the person who's making the argument expects that person to care, that's going to cause the person making the argument to become quite frustrated, and rightly so. And it's going to be completely ineffective to change how the discussion proceeds. Okay, so how about this for a reformulation or a rewarding? A problematic tiger move is defined as a logical response that is only effective when placed in a specific context. Or in other words, a problematic tiger move is a context-dependent logical response. Because it doesn't even necessarily have to be malevolence in this case. It can also just be a complete rejection as to what the rules of discourse are. Mm -hmm. I have seen these sorts of situations play out with questions like gun control, for example. The more I think about it, I think the gun control debate is actually a really nifty thumbed down example of this problematic tiger move. Because for some really odd reason, the gun control debate is always restricted to an American context. And so the gun control debate always revolves around, oh, but the Constitution guarantees mm. the individual right to keep and bear arms. Or even if you banned guns, what would you do with all the other guns in circulation? But then you take that discourse and you put it into an international context. You put it in the context where the person you are speaking with, the person who is participating in the conversation, the person sitting on the other end of the stereotypical Second Amendment advocate is somebody from a non-American context who comes from a country that possesses draconian gun laws, who looks at you and says, we don't have a Second Amendment, looks at you and says, we have no guns in circulation. They've all been taken away. Nobody has guns. Why should the individual ought to be allowed to own firearms when the entire population has already guaranteed been disarmed? 
is this individual for owning firearms or against? Does it not matter? It doesn't really matter, but for the sake of making it thumb down, we can put them on opposite ends. So you have the stereotypical American Second Amendment advocate, and then you have the stereotypical international anti-gun ownership mm -hmm. individual, because that's stereotypically what happens. I see. Where the international individual who's saying that gun ownership is not important ought to be banned. That, and um, I personally have seen individuals from places like Japan, places like Iran, Singapore. Singapore doesn't even allow you to have bows and arrows. Usually Asia-based countries who come out and just say this outright. Number one, we have no second amendment. Number two, the government has guaranteed that the entire population is disarmed because any kind of minor, minor infraction on quote unquote weapons laws comes down with a vicious state mandated punishment. Anything ranging from life imprisonment to execution. We're talking like a level of persecution that equals what you would expect from major narcotics infections. And these individuals then looking at the generic American Second Amendment advocate and saying, this is good. All right. Well, is the right to keep and bear arms something that only applies to Americans? Only applies to the United States? Or is that fundamental to humans? If it's fundamental to humans, you don't get to cite the Constitution anymore. You don't get to cite the weapons that are already in circulation. You have to cite something deeper. And so what I would point to as a very thumbed down example of what counts as a problematic tiger move using the cliche example of the second amendment argument is what do you do when you leave the American context? Does it just evaporate? Because if it just evaporates, guess what? It's not that fundamental. Mm -hmm. I have a question actually. One of the things that comes to mind when you're talking about these draconian measures is that there's a situation where someone is saying weapons are terrible. If you have weapons, that is punishable by some kind of an extreme punishment. And we are going to arrest you using weapons. Weapons are terrible. If you have weapons, we're going to use weapons to execute you. Would that be a problematic tiger move? I think it would because okay. the generic citizen of Japan, the generic citizen of Singapore would just look at you dead in the face and says, doesn't count. That's the government. Only the government gets to have weapons. But you are a private citizen. But you can't claim a universal principle that says weapons are terrible. Right. So the universal principle just becomes weapons are terrible for private citizens. If you do not work for the government, you do not get a weapon. Individuals only get weapons insofar as they are appendages of the state. The generic Japanese citizen, the generic Singaporean citizen will look at every American Second Amendment advocate dead in the face and say those words without flinching. Okay. So if you try to say, but the Second Amendment, then they don't care. Yeah. And if what you try Second to say Amendment? weapons in circulation, then they don't care. And if you try to say... If weapons are so bad, then why do you let the government have weapons? And they say, I still don't care. Yep. What do you say, Colin Noir? Where do your precious principles go as soon as you extract it from its home context? This is the reason why I say that this is such a clean thumb down example of problematic tiger move. More specifically, it's a problematic tiger move to the people who are defending or a part of the authority that's trying to dance around enough to stay in power. Well, not only that, I mean, yes, but another aspect of this that I find particularly heinous, particularly in the context of this thumbed down example, is that when I look at the generic American Second Amendment advocate and you point this out to them, they say, don't care. Hmm. That's over there, Stan. Hmm. I don't care about not America. Sucks for them. Okay, so then your precious freedoms are really just goodie bags that you only really are concerned that you yourself get to enjoy and have? That doesn't strike me as particularly fundamental. Mm -hmm. What that means then is that all your Second Amendment bloviating is just excuses. 
This is an example of how to ineffectively make the argument in discourse, even though it's sort of rooted in something correct, but it's not... It's not correct it's enough. It's not correct. It's not correct enough. It isn't fundamental enough in its ability to be universally applied. There might be a couple of techniques in order to make the claim about the Second Amendment more fundamental so that it doesn't just apply to the United States Constitution. I agree. I would even go so far as to say someone who says weapons ought to be banned falls into the category of there's something wrong here. That shouldn't be the case. How do we respond? This person has a chance to go back on their ways and maybe they will. But if they don't, then what do we do? Mm -hmm. How do you proceed? How do you proceed in the face of someone who says, We Singapore have zero gun violence. Bang. We Japan are a peaceful society and have low violent crime and likewise zero gun violence. Bang. What is your bang signifying? The sleeve of the monkey. Oh, I see. That's the distraction. Mm -hmm. We have an effective government and the police does their job. Mm. Bang. Monkey sleeve. Okay. Governments not being able to enforce gun control and gun laws is an American problem. Bang. Sure. My country, your country. My country, your country. Especially to someone who tries to say, but it's the law. I agree. There's no way to say, because it's the law, it's therefore good all the time. The law is not always good. That shouldn't be difficult to claim. That response is a bit easier to come up with because of the Nuremberg trials. Because of the fact that the workers at Auschwitz and the SS and the extermination squads under the Third Reich, they did nothing illegal. Everything they did, the entirety of the Holocaust and the Jewish final solution, was all in accordance to law. There was nothing illegal about Dachau, Auschwitz, Treblinka. It's all completely illegal. It doesn't matter. There are some things so heinous that they are removed from considerations of what is or is not legal. The fact that it is legal is completely immaterial to the question. Now, this is a bit off track, but I feel that if we're going to touch upon it, we need to acknowledge it fully. The problem is this history, this information is usually glossed over, if not outright suppressed, particularly in a non-American context. The generic citizens of Asian nations, of Asian countries, typically are unaware of what the Nuremberg trials were and what their significance was where someone was not able to claim the defense of just following orders. Correct. The law of the Third Reich required people to hand Jews over. Mm -hmm. You must obey all relevant laws and regulations. It was illegal to harbor Jews. The question of whether or not something is or is not legal is immaterial to the point of what ought to govern human behavior. But that's a side point. So, someone who is trying to say, but it's the law to be able to own weapons in the face of someone who is not subject to that law or someone really at all, even someone that is subject to that law, that's not sufficient in order to say that that's the reason why weapon ownership ought to happen or ought not to happen. There needs to be a universal principle that applies. And a law existing is not a universal principle. I want to just briefly clarify that would be a state-mandated law. Legislation. Legislation. Yeah. The way that von... I'm Mie talking about laws of physics. I'm talking yeah. about legislation. So the way von Mises distinguishes it is that he makes a distinction between law and legislation. That's perfect. So we have the definition for problematic tiger move. We have a fairly strong thumb-down example. What you said was a specific context. Right. So a problem... Only effective in a specific context. Yeah. So a problematic tiger move is a logical response that is only effective when placed in a specific context. It's not freestanding, to use that term from previous episodes. Mm -hmm. So that would apply to the parable in the way that the tiger was using the combat techniques for evading gunshots? 
-hmm. that that is great for evading gunshots, but that's not great for that's not what he the was context that he needed. Correct. So if the context changes, then your methods are useless. Correct. For the sake of being thorough, I can also provide an alternative example to sort of further illustrate the problem of this problematic target move. We also need to compare it to the bull, which I think will solidify that definition. So hmm. would you prefer to present another example? It's fairly quick. And I'm not actually the one who came up with this. Michael Malice is the one who came up with this, or at least Michael Malice is the one who I heard this from. And it's the debate on, instead of gun control, book control, book censorship. Certain books cannot be allowed. The state cannot allow the populace to read certain books. And Michael Malice's response to that is, the desires of the state are completely irrelevant. Technology has made book censorship a completely obsolete mode of discourse. Everybody in the world now has a smartphone. Even in the poorest of countries, everybody has a touchscreen in their pocket that is connected to the internet. It doesn't matter how much you try to censor the internet, all you need is for somebody to walk in with a single USB or a single micro SD chip plugged into something or downloaded from some server, some website, you can download any book you want straight to your phone. Entire libraries. The entire notion of censoring books is now an asinine discussion. How do you censor something that is replicatable an infinite number of times? and possesses no physical form. So that would be something that is the opposite of a problematic tiger move, because that's a level of logic that applies even to North Korea. And he does apply it to North Korea. North Korea is kind of Michael Malice's pet project. It doesn't matter where in the world you go, that logic always holds. When the monkey proclaims, the government must forbid the populace from reading certain books, and Michael Malice says, the desires of the government on this question are completely irrelevant. How do you ban PDFs? This is also supposed to go deeper than what is or is not enforceable. I grant that it's not enforceable to censor books. Essentially, that the internet has made book censorship obsolete. Where are you putting the tiger in this discussion? I'm saying that this is not a tiger move. Oh. It's not a bull move but it's not a problematic tiger move. Okay. So for the sake of example, someone saying the state must keep people from reading certain books, a problematic tiger move then would be... An appeal to the First Amendment. Mm. Just like an appeal to the Second Amendment for mm. gun control. But freedom of speech. But freedom of speech. Correct. Someone saying, but we don't have a First Amendment. Does freedom of speech still matter to me? Yes, by the way, it does. The reasons for the universal applicability of freedom of speech is something I think that we can return to because that's outside of the scope of what it is that we're discussing now. Correct. Important as it is. I would direct our audience listening at home if they have the chance to see something that is basically the diametric opposite of a problematic tiger move would be to go to YouTube and search for Dr. Jordan Peterson giving a speech at a conference of journalists. And he was invited to be a guest speaker. And he was talking about the significance of freedom of speech as it was tied to the logos, as it was tied with the ability to think. And I remember very clearly the first time I saw the video of that speech he gave, my jaw dropped. I was simultaneously shocked and amazed at what it was that Dr. Peterson was able to pull off in that speech because he presented a case for the necessity of freedom of speech that could be dropped into any country on this earth. Go anywhere where there are human beings and you would not have to change a single word of his speech and it would still apply. No references to the Constitution, no references to Western liberal democracy, no references to Western civilization. 
he went as deep as ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamian myth to eludicate this point. This unwavering, this uncompromising necessity for the individual be able to speak as they see fit. I strongly urge our audience listening at home to investigate that recording. We're probably putting a link of it in the description. Which I think brings us to the question of the bullhorns. Specifically his horns. Specifically his horns and his forehead. So the bull has a different way of approaching discourse. And the bull is more cumbersome in his approach. As he says, I am slow. And as it turns out, the bullhorns, which would be the second term. The first one being a problematic tiger move. The second one being what we refer to as the bullhorns. Generating the bullhorns, creating a situation where the bullhorns exist, can be a very lengthy, challenging, sometimes tedious process, but worth it. Basically, what happens with the bullhorns is that within the discourse, rather than a logical response only effective in a specific context that allows for the individual to change the context in order to evade the argument, the alternative requires choosing the terms of which declarations to accept and then allowing for the momentum of those declarations to functionally trap the individual where there is nowhere to escape except to go back on what they had said before. And that's part of the intention of what would move the discourse forward in terms of someone who's interested in a consistent engagement and actually having what can be called a legitimate discussion rather than responding and then having someone come to another talking point. What you refer to is this ability to take the hit on the forehead and to trap this individual within the bullhorns and now they cannot escape. One of the horns of the bull horns would be a premise that the character that is the monkey would make. You have to take a premise and grant it. All right, let's say that that's true. If you say that that's true, that's not going to go well for you because granting that that's true leads you into this bullhorn. And this allegory of bullhorns actually is not something that I made up or that we made up. Ancient Greek philosophy makes mention of a similar idea of bullhorns, of slipping the bullhorns, of trying to get out of a paradox. This picture, this citation of an image of bullhorns is not anything new. If the individual, as the character of the bull, is able to grant some premises, that's one way to take the hit on the forehead. Where you say, all right, that's fine. Let's grant what you're saying is true. If that's true, then you have problems. So then the monkey would try and go a different direction, but that direction is somewhat predictable. So if you know which direction that they're going to move, the other bullhorn is, would you say that it's the response to their follow-up? It's a response to something else that they claim. Okay. It might be easier to use an example for this one too. And I have one. I had seen several examples of bullhorns on paper and the allegory of the bullhorns taken from Greek philosophy and philosophy class. But I remember there was this one time when I was in university and there was this event. Several of the philosophy students went to this event and they had this guest speaker from overseas. She was some research lady who had come in from China to give a talk about China in the context of international relations. And what was particularly interesting was this was the time when the spat between China and Japan over the Senkaku Islands was going on. And so the way that I remember the spat, there's this entire controversy over whether the Senkaku Islands, do they belong to Japan? Or are they Chinese territory? Or are they Japanese territory? I forget what the main thrust of this lady's talk was about, but she made mention of the Senkaku Islands and she was talking about how the Senkaku Islands have been a part of Chinese territory since ancient times. And that because the Senkaku Islands were a part of Chinese territory, therefore the Senkaku Islands belong to China. 
And so I was sitting there and then of course Q&A comes along and then there's this guy who stands up and goes with the microphone and he said, I need further clarification as to whether or not you're saying that something belonging at some point in the past to Chinese territory is a necessary condition or a sufficient condition for being considered to be a part of China. Because I don't think that particularly the Chinese state is in a position to say that it's a sufficient condition because Outer Mongolia used to belong to China as well. But China acknowledges Outer Mongolia as a separate country. So either you are going to have to say Outer Mongolia is not a separate country, that it is a part of Chinese territory, which the Chinese government does not do because they have diplomatic relations and they have an embassy in each other's countries. They acknowledge each other as two separate countries. And if you accept that, then what that means is that being a part of Chinese territory is only a necessary condition. So if it's a necessary condition, then there's no need to talk about it because we can grant that it's a necessary condition, but it's necessary, not sufficient. What are the other conditions that the Senkaku Islands fulfill that retain it within, quote unquote, being an inalienable part of China, but Outer Mongolia is an alienable part of China because it was a part of China, but then it no longer was a part of China. So how do you reconcile these two claims that cannot possibly be true at the same time? This is a very rough representation of how I'm remembering the story, but just as a thumbed down example, this was the first time I saw live in the wild an example of the bullhorns. And this lady who had been brought in to give her talk, she basically just resulted to ad hominem right there in the auditorium. It was just a complete demonstration that you're not escaping from this because the premise was granted. Okay, I grant premise A, but you are also trying to declare premise B. And these two things don't align. You have to give one up. But if you give one up, either one of these destroys your position. The problematic tiger move response to some territory being part of somewhere since ancient times. What does the tiger move typically look like? The context sensitive one. But it's uh, not part of it now. That is a problematic tiger move. I'm thinking back to the Russian takeover of Crimea. There were a lot of discussions about Crimea belonging to Ukraine versus, oh, but before it was a part of Russia, but it was given from Russia to Ukraine back when Russia and Ukraine were still both a part of the Soviet Union. It's hard for me to come up with a clean example of a problematic title move as it pertains to the question of geography and territory in recent times. Perhaps one that hits more close to home would be a lot of talking points about the United States, and this very little to do with territory, actually. The cultural identity of the United States being fundamentally Anglo-Saxon, for lack of a better word. The idea of the United States is a country that is imbued with such and such characteristics, and so therefore needs to be kept as such and such. But then there are a lot of us who look at that and go, well, hang on a second. Granted, what I'm describing is a relatively fringe view when viewed through the lens of the general United States, but I reference people like Jared Taylor as an example, his Amran project. The idea that the United States ought to be viewed as a kind of ethnostate and ought to be maintained as such. A lot of us look at that and the immediate question goes, well, hang on a second. How do you then account for the American Indians, the First Nations that were already here when the European settlers first arrived? And this is usually in the context of more to do with immigration than it has to do with territory. I mean, territory is kind of a tangential example, but there's some problematic tiger moves when people talk about things like demographic takeover, as an example can't have open borders because of demographic takeover. All right, fine, be that as it may. A lot of the tiger moves seem to be revolving around, oh, we're a nation of immigrants, we need open borders. And then other people saying, we can't have open borders because of demographic takeover and the problems that come with demographic takeover. 
all of these problematic tiger moves seem to miss the central question of, well, demographic takeover has already happened on this plot of dirt. It happened with Manifest Destiny and the expansion westward. More of like the bullhorns argument would be, how do you account for the history of demographic takeover already occurring? The thing that you are trying to prevent against to preserve was founded upon demographic takeover in and of itself. So why was it okay that time, but then not okay this time around? It's not a perfect bull horns, but that would be more in the direction of a bull versus a lot of the immigration debate in the States of we need open borders. We're a nation of immigrants versus we can't have open borders because the demographic takeover will then completely unravel the ability to have any kind of meaningful representative government. These are all what I would categorize as problematic tiger moves. Sure, that's perfectly fine. You can make the argument that demographic takeover will lead to some kind of unraveling, but how do you defend that that's a problem given the history? I'm on the front of the train, but that's as best as I can manage. Well, immigration has other factors, which is what makes it not a perfect set of bullhorns. The thing within the bullhorns is still a logical response, but it's a response that procedurally grants premises so as to not allow a shift in the topic to occur. At the point where the bullhorns are fully deployed, the individual who's looking at the bullhorns has two options and neither of them are good. I mean, technically there are three options, but the third option is to retract your position completely. So if someone is going to retract their position completely, like the individual talking about territory, like I was saying earlier, wouldn't it be great if she said, oh, wow, that just makes too much sense now, doesn't it? I don't have an answer for you. So I'm going to retract that point, and I'm actually going to never say territory as a claim of ancient times again until I can figure out how to resolve this contradiction. Wouldn't it be great if that was the response? If only That pig, would have been nice, right? If only pigs could fly. Well, I want to recognize that that is a possibility, although in practice, in the observable world, that doesn't seem to happen as often as either of us would like, which is, well, we would like for it to happen all the time. We would like for it to happen at all. We would like for it to happen slightly. We're very happy when it ever happens. In the case of this woman that you're describing, it didn't happen. She didn't go back on her position. She instead attacked character and tried to do something else. But at that point, because there was no escape from that argument, she embarrassed herself. I don't think that the crowd agreed with the names that she called anyone. I don't think that the whole crowd piled on and said, yeah! Bad name, I agree, because she said so. Well, that's actually not the way to proceed through discourse. And that was the death of her argument. That was when her argument got trampled under the hoofs publicly. And then everyone walked away going, well, all right. So much for that. Moving on. The tumbling chaos was averted. The bull had inadvertently put a stop to the tumbling chaos that had characterized the tiger's duel with the monkey. Basically, the bullhorns is a situation where all the routes of escape are already accounted for. And the way that you are able to account for the routes of escape is you start with their own premises that they have to agree to. You start with their own declarations. And that's the initial map, I suppose, which needs to be accounted for with whatever would stop the escape. So granting that the declarations are true, that's when the staff comes down on the bull's face. Hmm in terms of the actual combat. And the bull has to be ready for this too. And he was, in a way. He just kept moving forward, ready to get hit in the head with a stick. So you take the hit on the forehead, you take something and you accept it. Say, all right, let's grant that that declaration is true. Then there's no way to account for these other problems. That's one side. So granting that a premise is true needs to lead to other issues, which it should. And then the dodge tries to happen. So the plan is enacted. It's like, all right, if this doesn't work, then we can always jump over to here instead. But if you already know what that is, because that's the standard follow-up to the initial set of declarations that have already been granted, 
than already accounting for the problems that are a contradiction to the initial declarations would create a situation where the only way out is to deny the initial side, the left side, deny the escape side, the right side, or to deny the entire declarations that were initially granted, all of which lead to the initial declarations that were granted to be destroyed. So I have a cleaner formulation that I want to try and posit. The bullhorns is a dichotomy strategy that incontrovertibly demonstrates a contradiction by first granting an opponent's premise. Okay. And a contradiction is simply a situation in which two statements cannot be true at the same time. Either one must be true, the other false, or the other must be true, and the first one false. You have two statements, only one can be true, pick one. You can do that, you can pick one, but that means everything else that is connected to the one that you declare to be false goes with it. Presumably this dichotomy is a consequence of the initial premise being granted. Mm -hmm. Because picking one of the two will always destroy the initial premise that's granted. Mm -hmm. I think that that's how it works. We use this term all the time to refer to a situation where there's no possible response. Basically, it's a situation where if you're encountering especially a form of malevolence and you want to push back against it, but maybe just something that have a universally applicable context, there is no response that this opponent can have based on the opponent's own terms. And that's one of the fundamental distinctions between the strategy of the tiger and the strategy of the bull. It's not just the power of rationality that's required in order to keep the person in the position of the monkey from dodging the argument. There needs to be a situation where this opponent cannot dodge because of their own premises. These are things that you said, and we're on to the next thing. We already granted the thing that you said. You, the opponent, don't want to go backwards. But the thing is, because we can only go forward from here, we can go to one of two directions, and you can't go to both sides, and both of them destroy the thing that you've already committed to. There's a rather obnoxious example that has yet to be resolved but I don't know exactly if it's our intention to resolve this into the bullhorns at the moment, or whether it's better to just point at this and say it's possible to resolve this into the bullhorns, but the bullhorns take some planning. The bullhorns, as I look at the objective of this podcast and what this podcast is trying to accomplish, the bullhorns are definitely going to return. All of these terms are going to return. So long as the audience at home is able to have these succinct definitions, again, this is a toolkit. If the audience at home can grasp onto these thumb down tangible definitions of the terms themselves, I guarantee they will return in use in full force. So for the sake of absolute clarity, what I have here for the definition of a problematic tiger move. It is a logical response that is only effective when placed in a specific context. And the bullhorns is a dichotomy strategy that incontrovertibly demonstrates a contradiction by first granting an opponent's premise. And the reason why that works is because in a dichotomy, a dichotomy is a situation in which you have two claims that cannot be true at the same time. That's what makes it a contradiction. Right. We can create more examples of the effectiveness of this, but just for the sake of example, we did go somewhat extensively into the problematic tiger move that was responding to weapons ought to be banned. My first question would be, does the bullhorn response to weapons ought to be banned exist? It probably does. I mean, do you know it right now? Is that no? No. Okay. I would have to be... We would have to derive it. I would have to strap myself to the front of the train for that. Well, I just wanted to return to that because it would be a very clean and succinct example of comparing the problematic tiger move to the bullhorns in terms of its effectiveness. I have a Michael Malice style response to it, but I don't think it qualifies as bullhorns. Okay. This goes into another follow-up point, which is... 
establishing the bullhorns and preparing the bullhorns is an enormous task. Yeah, it's not obvious and intuitive. It takes some very serious preparation. Work that's well worth doing. But it's difficult to ensure that an opponent in a discussion or debate stays on topic when they're trying to dodge. Especially when an opponent, for example, isn't interested in responding to your own statements. They're just interested in ensuring that they can keep their position alive by saying whatever needs to be said, saying whatever they need to and dodging to somewhere else. So you have to be able to pin that down and not let them dodge it to go somewhere else. And it's possible to do that strategically by creating a dichotomy. It ends up being a contradiction using their own arguments, using their own premises. This is a situation where someone is saying something that is wrong. It needs to be stopped somehow. If they keep going, what do we do? The answer would be figure out what you can grant. And if you have the utmost faith that these declarations will invariably fail to stand on their own merit, then there will be a dichotomy to derive. The way in which these declarations fail to stand on their own merit is when granting them creates this dichotomy. That's how it's demonstrated. If you grant it and it doesn't create a dichotomy, maybe it does stand on its own merit. But if it doesn't stand on its own merit, there are going to be quite a number of problems that you have to choose from. And it is very strategic how you need to proceed with that. In the case where someone is using the technique of the monkey and they're being confronted with a dichotomy which establishes a contradiction by granting their own premises, that's not going to reveal a pretty side of your opponent. They're not going to be happy about that in terms of ad hominem, violence, the character of the monkey strikes the bull on his face with a stick. It's everything he can do to escape. Hopefully that doesn't happen in terms of people going back on things. I keep returning to that, but if it doesn't, then that's still the best way to proceed. So the term the bullhorns will come back, but it'll come back when we are referring to acknowledging these kinds of dichotomies, particularly within discourse, to make sure that people don't just escape. Because if you know someone's going to try and escape when you present them with an argument, you need to plan. If you know that someone's going to try to escape, you can't be surprised when they do try to escape, even though it's not good for them to do so. Sometimes, if not most of the time, the people who are doing this are going to try and escape anyways, even though it's not best. The best way to deal with it is to establish the bullhorns, because at least it works at all. It's cumbersome, and it's slow, and you have to take a hit. But if you pull it off, the monkey has no cloak anymore. The mask is gone. There's nothing to hide behind. The deception cannot continue. The deception cannot continue. And the frustration that the tiger experiences is resolved. I would go so far as to say that that's a better situation, if possible, if manageable. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been The Garot. So, until next time, Vidorius Parante. Keep breathing, everyone.